Uh, good evening and you're welcome to Prime Sports with me, Razak Musbao. And uh, let's start off with the Ghanaian delegate who, went, who was reported missing after the 2022 Commonwealth Games in Birmingham. Uh, he has been found and brought back to Ghana. The United Kingdom police publicized a list of persons yet to be found by their immigration with the name of the Ghanaian involved. However, Farida Idris, an administrative officer with the Ghana Olympic Committee, has revealed to Joy Sports that the individual has been found. With 101 athletes sent to represent Ghana at the just-ended Commonwealth Games, the nation had five medals to show for, three in the boxing arena and two in the track and field events. It was Ghana's best performance at the competition since 1998 in Malaysia, an achievement that will be rewarded. And the previous, that was Australia, both was 2018, produced just one medal. That is a bronze medal from JC Lati. And, and for this one, we produced three medals in boxing. That is Abraham Mensah with silver, Joseph Komi with silver, and Abdul Wahid um, Omar, who was a bronze medalist in 2014 in Scotland. He, he, he got another medal here with three. And then we have the American Joseph with bronze, and then 200 meters with Joseph Kolamo. Certainly, we'll be satisfied with what we've done. Well, you met the minister yesterday. Yeah. Uh, will something come from the GOC or in collaboration with the ministry to the athletes? Certainly, yes. Uh, before we departed, um, a lot of things were discussed. We had per diem discussed. The per diem were sorted out before we got to Ghana. So what is left is what is called the uh, medal bonus, which, uh, God willing, I'm sure, between Thursday and Friday is going to be sorted for all the athletes to get their medal bonus. How much is it? Uh, I'm not too <laughs> sure about the figure, but each bonus, depending on what you got. So silver is certainly different from what a bronze medal is got. And sometimes today, some qualification bonus, that one will need to be discussed and looked at before it's paid. Okay. But a controversial issue nearly marred the output of Team Ghana. It was reported by United Kingdom police that one Ghanaian delegate had not been found after the competition. It was believed the person ran away from camp for greener pastures elsewhere, but the assertion was quickly dismissed by Farida, who played an instrumental role in getting all delegates in Birmingham. Oh, it was a delegate. He, 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 he didn't run away, but he got lost. But he, he got arrived, lost. Yeah, he got lost. So he arrived in Ghana, I think on the 13th or 14th of August via Qatar Airways. As one of the coaches, he got lost. I think he was going out for shopping and he, he couldn't find his way. But we've been able to bring him back. So uh -huh. the one delegate is cancelled. So he has they, arrived in Ghana. So now it's solved. There's yes. no such problem. Our all, over not 100 not athletes or everyone, delegation is intact. 182. Everyone has arrived in their final destination. Oh. The next championship is in four years, scheduled to take place in Australia. Well, let's do some more because the Minister for Youth and Sports, Mustafa Yusif, has lauded head coach of the National Amateur Boxing Team, Ofori Asari, for guiding Ghana to three more medals at the Commonwealth Games. Asari's medal count for the country now stands at 132 and is also overseeing the development of Samuel Techi, who won Ghana an Olympic medal for the first time in 29 years. Of what we have achieved. By lifting the flag of our country, Ghana, very, very high at the tournament. About 70 countries and territories participated in this year Commonwealth Games. And out of that, not some went home without even a single medal. But Ghana, as a sporting nation, as we are, we have improved on our previous performance. Because the last time I checked, our last Commonwealth Games, we came home with only one medal. So getting five medals shows that there's a huge improvement. That tells me that maybe the next Commonwealth Games will be coming home with ten medals. <laughs> so Wahid, Deborah, Kobe, and uh, Abraham, and also just Joseph Paul Amwa. All of you, we are proud of you for what you have done for yourself and for the country. The coach, 
my good friend, Ofori. When you were leading the team to go, I know definitely you will not come home empty-handed because you have done it before. Uh, we have total confidence in you. Anytime you are taking our team, you did it in Tokyo, and you have done it again in Birmingham. I know you will be doing more, 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 more. Well, let's do some football now. And the former youth and sports minister, Elvis Ifriya Ankara, has waded into the conversation by Asamajan relative to his inclusion in the Black Stars ahead of the World Cup in 2022 in Qatar. And he says that the decision to include Asamajan in the Black Stars squad should be one that should be left to the technical team alone. Um, I saw a video of him this morning. Um, you know, training in a gym, and uh, it, it's entirely up to the coach. He has to assess him, his fitness, physical fitness, mental fitness, match fitness, because those are different levels. You have to be physically fit, your uh, state of mind, and then match fitness has to do with maybe your track record, maybe watching you in real time matches or training sessions to see if you are still sharp. So those are not decisions that I can just sit in my room and say, oh, yes or no. Those are decisions that those who are responsible have to do all the analysis and decide based on the facts and the evidence, and not, not on sentiments and emotions, because it's very easy to, oh, you shouldn't, you know, but that is entirely up to the technical team. I haven't seen him play for a while. I, haven't, I don't know what team he belongs to now. And um, so I leave that to the discretion of those who are charged with the responsibility of the but, but, I mean, would it be a good addition? Again, that would be the decision of the technical team. Because they would um, have to do the assessment themselves. And also based on their strategy, you know, we're going into a World Cup, the team um, the technical people will have a strategy as to the kind of play and formulation that they want to use. Whether they want to use an, an attacking, uh, predominant type of team or midfield predominant because we, are, we have a lot of talents who are in the midfield or defensive so-called one-goal project. So again, all these are things that those who are responsible will have to uh, make a decision on. Hmm. Okay. Now, now let's move away from that and get into some boxing now because Ghanaian boxer Isaac Dogbe has dismissed suggestions that he has lost his ability to deliver technical knockouts in his fight. The former WBO Super Bantam champion has won 16 of his 24 victories by way of knockout, but has not delivered a technical knockout win in his last three fights. Dogwe says delivering knockouts has become harder because of the quality of boxers in his division. Since I moved to 126, well, look, we are the world level, you know. Um, everyone is elite, you know. Um, I believe that when I was, when I was, when I turned pro, there was uh, a promoter in the UK that wanted to sign with me and, he said, and, and they said to me that, look, why do you want to go to America? You know, it's good to be a big fish in a low pond rather than being um, a big fish in a, you know, a small fish in a bigger pond. Yeah. With that being said, look, the reason why I went to America was because if you can make it in America, you can make it anywhere. America, they have, they have everyone there. They have the Africans, they have the Mexicans, they have the American, they have the British, they have the, you know, the Eastern Europeans, they have the Russians, they have everyone over there. So imagine fighting amongst or training alongside all these other people, mixing it up day in, day out, you know. Every now and then you come home with a swollen jaw, you know, with a, you know, swollen eye or something. But at the end of the day, you are learning something from it. So, you know, it hardens you. And um, it's the same as being at the top. You know, you're not climbing up. Sometimes the climb can be a little bit easier than when you're at the top, because at the top, Everyone is a shark. Everybody's a lion. Everyone wants to, you know, devour, to be a predator. So imagine walking among, you know, you have a few lions, you know, 
walking around, everyone wants to be the king. Knockouts don't come easy. Now, still in boxing, we continue our build-up to the part two of Alexander Yusik versus Anthony Joshua coming off this Saturday in Saudi Arabia. The two have been speaking at the official press conference ahead of the bout, and for Anthony Joshua, he's bent on achieving his target of reclaiming the world title. Yusik, however, says he's born to win. Well, joining us via Zoom to discuss the bout is Joy Sports boxing specialist Nathaniel Atto. Uh, Nats, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, help us understand what this bout really means. These are two heavyweight champions going at each other. What, what does this bout mean as far as the heavyweight division is concerned? Well, uh, Musbao, you're looking at a situation where, you know, you have the whole world looking for, you know, great boxing content. You're looking for a blockbuster bout that is going to get everybody talking. Away from that as well, you're looking for the settling of scores. It's as simple as that. Mm. And so in this case, there's a story that is being told us. We want to refer to the trilogies of yesteryear, you know, the, uh, you know, the Sugar Ray versus uh, Roberto Duran kind of uh, trilogy. Is this going to be a trilogy? Well, we've gotten to part two, so we need to finish part two first. But then in terms of its significance, Obviously, it is the biggest boxing event for the next half of the year. I don't see any other major event uh, competing with this in terms of significance and in terms of weight. I mean, these guys, these two guys have told different stories. I mean, look at what uh, Alexander Uzik has told the rest of the world uh, from the cruiserweight division and uh, the kinds of achievements he's made there. And we're also following the story of an Anthony Joshua who saw the first blip of his career uh, come through the loss that he suffered to a very chubby-looking uh, Mexican in Andy Ruiz at the time who surprised everybody. So clearly, everybody has gone back, everybody has sat back, learned lessons, and hey, bingo, it's, it's about on. And the kinds of financial rewards that are available for uh, you know these two boxers is something that we should all be happy about in the sense that we still have, uh, you know, brands and, uh, and products in the sport that are able to command these kinds of big figures. Obviously, Floyd Mayweather Jr. is still in a class of his own. But if you have two boxers splitting $150 million, uh, you know, uh, for, for basic persons, then it sure is a very good thing. So it's a big deal. There's no doubt about that. This bout is a very big deal. There is a lot to consider in terms of the kinds of stories that will be written after this, especially for the heavyweight division, which is also a division of great interest, you know, uh, around the world generally. All right. Um, now, I mean, when you consider Joshua, a lot of people describe this bout as one that puts his career on the line. The others who also talk about Alexander Yusik because he's one who's just returning from fighting for Ukraine against Russian Aggression. So you want to talk about the mindset that these two boxers go into this bout. Joshua has his career on the line. You seek is coming from, I mean, a war. What kind of mindset are these two boxers going into this, into this bout? And how will that impact the outcome of this bout? Well, uh, Alexander Uzik, in as much as he had a very smooth run in the, um, in the first installment, is also being very cautious in the sense that he knows that definitely um, Joshua would have watched the tape over and over again and will be looking forward to neutralizing him as early as he can so that he can get the job done as early as possible. Because we all do know that Anthony Joshua sometimes is stamina suspect, especially if you're able to run with him beyond the eighth round. You've said it already. Um, when you consider the geopolitics of the world at this time, you'd realize that Ukraine have to make a different statement to the rest of the world. That, look, we're not weak, we're not the smaller fish, we've got quality, and we can stand for our own. And there are sportsmen and women who have won laurels and have brought glory to the nation and to the Ukrainian flag and brought hope to the younger generation of Ukraine are at the forefront of these messages that they're sending in the face of this war. Therefore, an Alexander Uzik will definitely go in there 
with a combative mentality, wanting to stamp his authority and wanting to, to seal it off once and for all or seal it off a final time, just like, you know, uh, Tyson Fury did against um, Deontay Wilder in the, you know, that second installment of their, their bout, which silenced uh, all the critics once and for all. So um, for Anthony Joshua as well, we all do know that uh, this is a big crossroad in his career in the sense that he is a beautiful brand. There's no doubt about that. He's a lover boy uh, in terms of the kind of public appeal that he has. Um, a gentlemanly character, somebody who believes a lot in his family values, uh, still lives with, a, with his mother in their castle flag. He's got his money. He can afford to do anything that he likes, but he decides to live a very, very simple life. And I believe that all of these things have gone to help his public image, which also go to um, eventually feed into that whole image thing which sells you as a sportsman. Away from all of this, you put the whole fine boy characteristic away. Now he needs to get into the ring. And he needs to prove to the rest of the world that he surely is that champion worth his sword. Mm. Okay? Um, Joshua has his issues. And we, we do realize as well that Alexander Uzik um, exposed him a great deal in that first bout. Uzik is a southpaw. And anytime an orthodox boxer is fighting with a southpaw, it always becomes a little too difficult. You know, the southpaw, if he's crafty enough, just like Alexander Uzik was, is able to, uh, you know, bounce around, dance around the ring, um, you know, is able to release a, a flurry of punches, is able to penetrate your guard, is able to go around you easily, and is able to score good points, which is what Uzik did in the first bout. So this time, we need that killer instinct that saw uh, Anthony Joshua score major victories. For instance, in that rematch against Andy Royce, with that, that bout that saw him defeat one of the two Klitschko brothers, you know, what, you know all of those bouts that got him to, to sit in that space where everybody thinks that, okay, this is the guy to carry the championship image of the heavyweight division to the next level. All right, Nats, so, I want you to, I want you to uh, in comment on this because Nigerian-born New Zealand professional, mixed martial artist and former boxer with multiple championships in all three disciplines, Israel Adesanya, has backed Joshua to beat Yusik despite losing his first bout in his home yard. Now, Adesanya talks about Joshua tapping into his ancestry, and I want you to comment a bit on that. Now, let's listen to Adesanya, what he said, and get your thoughts on how Joshua can leverage on his ancestry to beat Yusik. So he said, tap into your heritage, your Nigerian heritage, tap into it. And of course, for Joshua, he's going back to Saudi Arabia, where he reclaimed his title against Andy Ruiz. So it's a bit of nostalgia, it's a bit of... Uh, a home ground for him of a sort. How does he tap into his, his ancestry? And also, how does he leverage on the Saudi Arabia, you know, resort, especially one which he had over Andy Ruiz? Well, um, we all do know our Nigerian brothers. I I'm a guy, and I trace my roots to Ileife, Nigeria. You know we are warriors. <laughs> Mosbao, um, uh, Israel Adesanya was... Uh, you know, spot on with that trait of our Nigerian brothers and sisters, that fighting spirit. Let me jump, jump out of the boxing ring and draw something from, you know, France 98, the FIFA World Cup that was played in France in the year 1998, when Nigeria beat the then highly rated Spain by three goals to two. Look, it was a back and forth encounter and we all hit our chests hard and bust in the glory that Nigeria got. That win has gone into the sands of time, even though it's not, uh, you know, a FIFA World Cup final. I mean, it's significant. And it is something that we all refer to with great pride. Do remember that, I like, you know, um, Anthony Joshua, Anthony Oluafemi Olasheni Joshua has changed 13. He has gone through 13 sparring partners in his training camp. It just goes to tell you that he knows what is at stake in this bout. He knows where he wants to get himself, and he does know what a win will do in terms of getting him back on the rail. 
look, if he loses, he's still a big fish. Only that definitely it will be a little more difficult trying to command maybe the kind of, uh, you know, the kind of big bucks that he'll command, especially because the belts are not there. But he does know what it means to get back up here. Well, that's, we, we, we definitely need to have a part two of this discussion tomorrow. We need to continue this definitely. discussion tomorrow as we, we build definitely. up to the big bout on Saturday. So we'll definitely come back to definitely. you tomorrow and look at the other dynamics involved in this very bout. Thank you so much, Nat, for speaking to us. Uh, the Nathaniel Atto, I mean, boxing specialist, whole Ghana, uh, or matched as far as that is concerned. We continue our build up to the boxing bout on Saturday, and tomorrow we'll return with another analysis. Do follow us on all our socials on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. And keep the conversation going. Who is going to win? Joshua versus Alexander Yusik. Who wins? This has been Prime Sports with me, Razak Musba. Do have a wonderful evening.